service was raising money for the children's hospital and Trevor the bus was helping Bella with her home improvements. He was doing some cementing in front of Bella's cafe when Fireman Sam came across the street carrying a small black case. Morning Trev, said Sam. What are you up to? Crazy paving? I've just finished putting in a shower for Bella and I've had to do a bit of work out here to finish up the cement, said Trevor. What have you got in that case, Sam? Raffle money, said Sam. For the children's hospital. Whoa, I've got some of that, said Trevor, and he took an empty raffle ticket book and some money out of his pocket. Here you are, Sam. Good man, said Sam. That should bring us up to about 300 pounds. Tidy little donation, that. Now, I'm just going to pop in on Bella and see if she'd like to buy a ticket. But when Sam came into the cafe, he could hardly move for piles of old books and cases and other rubbish. He put his own little black case down on the table and looked around. Good heavens, Bella. Is this a cafe, or are you having a bring and buy sale? Trevor, he's so kind. He's a put the on sweetie shower in my bedroom, and I have a good clean out at the same time. Now then, Bella, how about a raffle ticket? Of course. I take all the book, said Bella. But as she stretched across to take it from Sam. Oh, no! She knocked everything off the table and onto the floor. Fireman Sam picked up all the cases and boxes. I think this one's mine, he said, sorting out a little black case from the pile. Here you are, then. There are your tickets. Grazie, Sam. Goodbye. Mamma mia, what about the fingers I have today? When Sam arrived back at the fire station, he found Penny and Elvis looking at a huge basket full of apples, grapes, oranges, and other delicious fruit. What's that then? He said. Hello, Sam, said Penny. Mrs. Price has donated this fruit. It's not like her, that, being generous, said Elvis. She can't be feeling very well. Just then, Station Officer Steele came in from his office. What's all this, Fireman Sam? He asked. The charity appeal, sir, said Sam. We've already raised 300 pounds with the raffle. And he handed over the little black case to Station Officer Steele. Excellent. I knew I'd raised the money. You will find the bed for this afternoon's bed push around the back. I only wish I could join you. The bed was on wheels and Penny sat on it with a bucket to collect money in, while Sam and Elvis pushed it around the town. Oh, Pound Hill's quite steep, isn't it? said Sam. You're telling me it is, said Elvis, especially for pushing beds up. As they pushed the heavy bed up and down the hills of Pontypandy, Bella was just bringing all her old boxes and cases out of the cafe and piling them on the pavement by her garden gate. Finish. The day is a dawning. I have the shower tomorrow morning. All finished out here, Bella, said Trevor, standing up and admiring his new cement. I'll be on my way. Ah, first for you, cappuccino time, said Bella, going back into the cafe. Trevor was just about to follow her when Norman Price came round the corner. Ah! Oh. Quite cement, he said. I am, Mr. Levin. Norman Price, stay where you are, said Trevor. I don't trust you near my nice new concrete. Can I just write my name on the corner? No, you cannot. But Norman had an idea. He reached into his pocket and held out a paper bag. Hmm. Would you like?
like one of my boy sweets, Mr. Evans. Oh, I don't mind if I do. Thank you, Norman. Trevor stepped forward to take one of the sweets, and he put his foot right in the wet concrete. <laughs> Norman Price, you wait till I tell your mother, shouted Trevor. Norman's mother, Dillis, was at the bus stop a few streets away. She'd been waiting quite a long time. I don't know, she grumbled. What kind of bus did Trevor Evans think he's running? A slow coach? Suddenly she heard the sound of squeaking wheels, and round the corner came a great big iron bed. Hello, Dillis. We're on a sponsored bed push. Huh? Well, don't ask me to help, said Dillis. I haven't got enough energy to push my shopping trolley, never mind a great iron bed. I've been waiting a million years for Trevor the bus. No need to wait for a bus, said Sam. You can have a lift on the bed. Well, seeing as you were insisting, Sam, I think I will, said Dillis, sitting on the bed. Hmm, quite comfy, really. She took the collecting bucket from Penny, and off they went, with Penny, Sam, and Elvis pushing. And in no time at all, they were whizzing down the hill towards Dillis's shop. Oh, I feel like the Queen of Sheba. Well, I quite enjoyed that ride after all. Thank you, Sam. Cheerio, Dillis. Dillis climbed off the bed, and as Sam and the others trundled off down the street, she noticed the great pile of old boxes and cases stacked up outside Bella's cafe. Well, there's a little treasure trove. Bella was coming up with the last load. I think I nearly finish it now. Uh, Bella? You're not going to leave this stuff cluttering up the pavement, are you? Asked Dillis. No, I'm making the bonfire in the back garden, said Bella. What? You're going to burn all this? It's only rubbish. Oh, yes, uh, I can see that, said Dillis. But while Bella went inside again, she decided to have a good look through the stuff anyway, just in case there was anything worth keeping. Back at the fire station, Officer Steele was just settling down with his calculator and his accounts book to check the three hundred pounds Sam had collected. He took the little black case Sam had given him, put it on the table, and opened the lid. The case was completely empty. Good grief! Where's the money? Just then he heard Penny's voice. Did you see Dillis's face when she was riding down the road? Oh, hi, laughed Sam. Thought she was the bee's knees, didn't she? Station Officer Steele came to the door of his office. <coughs> Fire on Sam. Here we are, sir. A good few tanners to add to the 300. I think we'd better have a word in my office, please. Work, said Elvis. Something's up. Sam stepped into the office. What is it, sir? He asked, looking at Station Officer Steele's serious face. There was no money in the case, Fireman Sam. Not a penny. Where? Ah, where's it gone? Asked Sam, looking inside the case. When did you see it last? Well, earlier today, sir. I was in Paris Cafe, and I sold her some tickets. Hang on. This isn't my case. It looks like mine, but it isn't. What? Bella was having a cup of coffee with Trevor when the phone rang. It was Sam. Bella, listen carefully. Do you remember seeing a little black case this morning? Uh, yes, an old one. My uncle in Rome, he gave it me. Well, I think I've got yours here in the station. So you must have mine there in the cave. Don't let it out of your sight. We'll come over and fetch it straight away. Oh, no, Sam. I just put everything under the bonfire. Sam? In no time at all, Sam and the others were on their way to put out the bonfire and save the charity money. Jupiter screeched to a halt outside the cafe. Bella's cat Rosa was so frightened by the noise, she jumped onto Trevor's brand new wet concrete and made paw marks all over it. Oh, no! said Trevor as he and Bella came out of the cafe to see what all the fuss was about. 
It's only a bonfire I make, cried Bella. Sam kicked open her garden gate and ran in with the hose reel. But it was too late. There was nothing left but a pile of cinders. What a tragedy, said Sam. Three hundred pounds gone up in smoke. It's my fault, Sam, said Bella. I am so sorry. Everybody felt very miserable. They all went inside for a cup of coffee while Trevor got out his trowel and patched up his concrete again. Suddenly, the cafe door opened. And there stood Gillis Price, holding a small black case. Bella? Bella Lasagna? Where's that daft Italian millionaires? Look what I found. Three hundred pounds. She opened the case and took out a great handful of banknotes. Three hundred pounds, I'm telling you. She must have money to burn. Oh, Dillis, cried Sam. You don't know how close to the truth you are. It's wonderful you found the raffle ticket money. Trevor popped his head around the door. Third time lucky, he said. Concrete is finished, Bella, and if I say so myself, I've done it to a T. Oh, at the last, said Bella, and they all went outside to have a look. The concrete was lovely and smooth and wet, except for one thing. Someone had drawn a grinning face with spiky hair and glasses right in the middle of it with a stick. Everyone knew whose face it was. Oh, Norman Price! When he used to buy the time, Fireman Sam is there on time. Someone might be in a jam. So hurry, hurry, Fireman Sam. Always on the scene, Fireman Sam. And his engine bright and clean, Fireman Brass Band. It was a very hot summer's day in Ponty Pandy. Fireman Sam's niece, Sarah, and nephew, James, were heading for Sam's house. Sarah was lagging behind because she was examining a spider through her new magnifying glass. Come on, Sarah, called James. Let's see what Uncle Sam's up to today. Oh, cried Sarah. This spider seems like a giant monster through the magnifying glass. Inside Sam's backyard, Sam had invented a strange contraption. That's it, cried Sam triumphantly, as he finished screwing the last piece of metal in place. Just then, the twins arrived. Hello, you two, said Sam. What on earth is that? asked Sarah, as the children stared at the contraption, which had bits of vacuum cleaners, drums, and a trumpet attached to bellows. It's my automated, self-powered, sprocket-driven one-man band, explained Sam proudly. Ponty Pandy Fire Station is having a brass band concert in the park on Sunday, so I thought I'd invent an automatic brass band, in case we get called out to a fire halfway through the performance. Sarah and James stepped closer. I'll just give it a trial run, said Sam, as he pressed the vacuum cleaner button. The contraption burst into life. Metal arms banged the drums, cymbals clashed, and the trumpet blew. <laughs> <laughs> oh, laughed Sam. Not bad at all. Just needs a bit of tuning. Just a bit, whispered James to Sarah, who couldn't hear because she had her fingers in her ears. Suddenly the invention got faster and faster, and louder and louder. Oh no, cried Sam. Oh, it's, it's gone into overdrive. Just then the machine collapsed into an untuneful heap. Oh well, back to the drawing board, sighed Sam. I better clear off to the station as soon as I've tidied up this lot. Sam handed the children some money. 
I don't suppose you fancy an ice cream on a hot day like this? Chuckled Sam. Or oh, but have one on me anyway. Oh, great, cried Sarah. Brill, said James, as they dashed off to Bella's cafe. Later, outside Mrs. Price's shop, Dillis Price was talking to her son, Norman. What have you got there? she asked. It's my new telescope, said Norman. Would you like a go? Dillis peered through it. My, I didn't know Mrs. Morgan had new curtains. And I'll be... Oh, Mrs. Jones has painted her bathroom green, clucked Dillis, who was the nosiest person in Ponty Pandy. Oh, well, I never, she went on. Oh, look at Mr. Evans. Oh, oh, yes, very interesting, Norman, she said, handing it back. Oh, I don't want people thinking I'm nosy. Anyway, I got work to do. Dillis didn't realise that it was a trick telescope that had boot polish on the end that she'd looked through. Norman chuckled quietly at the black ring around his mother's eye. Just as Dillis went into the shop, Sam came round the corner carrying his trumpet case. Morning, Norman, said Sam. You should be in the park on a hot day like this. Would you like a go on my telescope? asked Norman mischievously. Sam peered through it in the general direction of the fire station. Oh! <gasps> My, I can see Jupiter, said Sam. But that's millions of miles away, replied Norman. No, it's not, said Sam. Jupiter, the fire engine, is in the fire station. <laughs> Sam chuckled at his joke as he handed back the telescope to Norman and headed into the shop, not realising that now he had a black eye too. Norman giggled. Inside the shop, Sam was about to ask for a newspaper when he spotted Mrs Price's black eye. Dillis spotted Sam's at the same time. Oh, my, what a lovely shiner, they both said together. No, you got a black eye, said Dillis. No, you got one, replied Sam. They both put their fingers to their eyes and then examined their fingers, which were covered in boot polish. We've been had, said Sam. Oh, that boy I mine, Norman, she screeched. But Norman had dashed off, chuckling. What a great trick. Sam wiped his eye clean with a hanky as he walked across the road to Bella's. Inside, the twins were eating a huge ice cream as Sam walked in. Oh, they look tasty, said Sam. Morning, Bella, he said. I hope to see you at the park on Sunday to hear Ponty Pandy's finest brass band. What is it you play, Sam? asked Bella. Sam lifted his trumpet case. The trumpet, of course, he said grandly. You'll have to go a long way to hear a trumpet played like mine, said Sam. Yes, said Bella dryly. It sound like you certainly know how to blow your own trumpet, Sam. The children giggled as Sam coughed. Yes, uh, well, can I have my usual cheese and chutney sandwiches, please, Bella? I got a rehearsal to go to. Bella wrapped up Sam's sandwiches and handed them over. What are you up to today? said Sam to the twins. We're going apple picking, replied James, as Sarah examined his nose with a magnifying glass. Oh, what a giant hooter, she giggled. Have fun called Sam as he left the cafe. Outside the cafe, Trevor pulled his bus alongside Sam. Morning, Trevor, said Sam. You going to the band practice? Yes, replied Trevor, who was an auxiliary fireman as well as a bus driver. Hop in, I'll give you a lift to the station. Sam climbed in and off they went. Later, James and Sarah were on their way to the countryside. As they neared the fire station, a deafening din came from inside. As the tuneless screeching, bonging and banging got louder, they held their ears. Oh, it sounds like they really need to practice, said James. I know what Uncle Sam means about having to go a long way to hear a trumpet played like his, chuckled Sarah as they hurried out of earshot. Inside the station house, Station Officer Steele was standing on a box in front of the crew, who were all holding their musical instruments. Sam had his trumpet, Elvis a trombone, and Trevor had a large drum strapped to his chest. Right, men, barked Steele, tapping the music sheet with his baton. One, two, three. At that moment, instead of playing the instruments, the crew burst out laughing. Hold it! Hold it! shouted Steele. What's so funny? Steele didn't realise he had a big black ring around his eye. Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, nothing, no, sir, coughed Sam, realising that Norman had been up to his tricks again. In, in that case, said Steele sternly, let's get on with it. One, two, three. As he tapped the baton for the second time, the crew began playing, or at least trying to. 
Elvis began too enthusiastically and poked the trombone through Trevor's bass drum with a brrrr, followed by a loud ripping noise. No, look what you've done, cried Trevor. How can I play it now? Oh, oh, uh, uh, oh uh, uh, sorry, Trevor, stammered Elvis. I uh, got carried away. Hold it, hold it, interrupted Steele, tapping his baton. You can play the cymbals instead. Trevor went to get the big shiny cymbals and stood up at the back, arms outstretched ready. These are even louder than my drum, chuckled Trevor, anxious to get started. So, all ready? asked Steele. When I point my baton at you, Sam, stand up for your solo. And when I point at you, Evans, you clash your cymbals. Right-o, sir, he replied. Ready? One, two, three. Steele pointed the baton in the general direction of Sam and Evans. Sam stood up quickly, poised to play his trumpet, and at that very moment, Trevor, who thought it was his cue, clashed the cymbals around Sam's ears. Oh! cried Sam. Oh, uh, uh, sorry, Sam, said Trevor. Steele just held his head and groaned. Meanwhile, Sarah and James were walking across Pandy Farm. Oh, phew! Oh, it's warm, said Sarah. Look at those juicy big apples, said James, pointing at the nearby trees. Come on, he cried as they dashed towards them. Sarah didn't notice that her magnifying glass had fallen out of her pocket onto the grass. Sarah and James began climbing a large apple tree. Be careful, called James to Sarah. Ha! I can climb better than you, she replied. Last one to get an apple's a sissy, laughed James. Soon they reached the apples and began picking them and stuffing them in their pockets. They hadn't noticed that the sun had streamed through Sarah's magnifying glass and the heat had made the grass smolder. Soon flames flickered on the dry grass. The twins, meanwhile, their pockets stuffed with apples, climbed back down the tree. Look, cried Sarah, pointing to the field. The grass has caught a light. The flames had begun to spread across the bone-dry grass. We better phone the fire station, cried James, and they ran to a phone box. At that moment in the fire station, Steele was on the verge of tearing his hair out. No, 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 he barked. You sound like a cat choir. One more time, otherwise we'll never be ready for Sunday. He tapped his baton. One, two, three. As he tapped his baton for the third time, the fire alarm went off. Right then, he commanded. Let's get to it. Anything is better than band practice, muttered Sam under his breath. Steele ripped the paper from the telex machine. There's a grass fire at Pandy Farm, he shouted, as they all made for the fire engine. Soon they were roaring through Ponty Panty, sirens blaring and lights flashing. Sarah and James, meanwhile, had noticed a rack of fire beaters made from twigs in the corner of the field. Perhaps we could try and put the fire out ourselves, said James. It's too dangerous, replied Sarah. We'd better leave it to Uncle Sam. Just then, they heard Jupiter's siren. Oh, thank goodness, said Sarah. The fire's beginning to spread. Sam drove the engine across the field. Stand back, you two, said Sam to the twins, as the crew climbed down and made for the beaters. Soon Sam and the crew were beating furiously until they had the fire under control. That should do it, said Sam. Oh, it, it, it's a bit smoky, <laughs> coughed Elvis. I think we'd better hose down the area, said Steele. You can't be too careful when the grass is as dry as this. Elvis and Sam gave the area a good dousing down with the hoses. They even let Sarah and James help. Good work, Matt, said Steele. Make up, and we can be off. As they rolled the hoses up, Sam spotted Sarah's magnifying glass. Aha, uh -huh. oh, so that's what caused the fire to start. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Uncle Sam. It, it must have fallen out of my pocket, said Sarah. Oh, accidents can happen, said Sam. It just goes to show how careful you must be. Sarah and James had a lift back to Ponty Pandy and Jupiter. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm famished moaned Elvis as they drove. All, all that work has uh, given me an appetite. Sarah and James produced their apples. Oh, oh great, cried Elvis. And soon they were all munching away. Sunday finally arrived. It was a lovely warm day for the brass band to perform. Everybody in Ponty Pandy turned out. Bella had brought along ice cream and lemonade for everyone, which was set out on a table with a pink tablecloth. There were two lines of striped deck chairs for the audience placed in front of the bandstand. The band was setting up their instruments. The audience were helping themselves to ice cream and lemonade before settling into their seats. It's a so exciting, said Bella. Just to think, it's a ponty band, it's a very honorable band. As long as they don't play any modern rubbish, 
sniffed Dillis Price. Anyway, I can't stay too long. I gotta cook lunch for my lovely little Norman. Come to think about it, where is Norman? Norman, mischievous as ever, had spotted that the firemen had left their helmets upside down by their feet. He sneaked over to the bandstand, and while Fireman Sam was studying his sheet music, he plopped a big dollop of ice cream into Sam's upturned helmet. <laughs> Chuckled Norman. He'll get a surprise when he puts it on. The band began tuning their instruments. Station Officer Steele stepped up to his music sheet stand. Right, men. Today, I want the best performance of your lives, Steele commanded. Then under his breath, shouldn't be difficult to improve on what I've heard so far. With that, he took out a wadge of cotton wool and stuffed a piece in each ear. The audience had settled down, and there was an air of excitement as Station Officer Steele tapped the button. One, two, three. At that very moment, a huge clap of thunder boomed through the sky. Next, the heavens opened, and it began pouring with rain. Oh, cara mia, cried Bella. I don't want to get my new dress soaked. Oh, let's take shelter, screeched Dillis. Soon, the whole audience dived for the bandstand. Within minutes, everybody was squashed together, the band, the audience, and their instruments. Oh, looks like that's the end of our performance, said Fireman Sam. Well, that's a blessed relief, muttered Steele under his breath. What about me? wailed Norman, who was unable to get onto the bandstand for people. I I'll get soaked. Here you are, said Sam. This will keep you dry. And he handed Norman his helmet. Norman, forgetting about the ice cream, put it on, and the ice cream ran down his face. Oh, ew, oh, he spluttered. Everybody laughed. Serves him right, chuckled Sam. <laughs> It was a very windy day in Pontypandy. Fireman Sam looked out of the window at the trees swaying in the strong breeze. I'm glad we had a calm day for the fun run yesterday, he thought. Station officer Steele will be pleased with the money we raised for the Pontypandy Children's Hospital. I'll take this money with me to the fire station right now. Sam put the money into a brown envelope and wrapped up warmly against the wind. Sarah and James were outside Sam's house playing football. Hello, you two, called Sam. As he stepped outside the door, James kicked the ball high in the air. Watch out, Uncle Sam, warned Sarah, but it was too late. The ball landed on Sam's head with a thump. Ouch, he cried, dropping the envelope in surprise. Sorry, Uncle Sam, apologized James. Fireman Sam rubbed his head. Well, there's nothing broken. Just be more careful next time. As he bent down to pick up the money, a gust of wind caught the envelope and blew it down the street. Quickly, called Sam. The money for the children's hospital is in that envelope. Sam and the twins chased after the envelope, but the wind swept it higher and higher into the sky. As they watched gloomily, the envelope flew high over Pontypandy, then disappeared from view. Doro groaned Sam in dismay. We'll never catch it now. Fireman Sam and the twins had been so busy chasing the envelope they hadn't noticed firefighter Penny Morris driving up the road in Venus, her rescue tender. What's up? she asked. 
Sam explained the problem. I'd better go tell station officer Steele, he said, and trudged off to the station. Penny thought for a moment, then said brightly, I have an idea. We'll organise our own fundraiser to replace the money. Brill, said James. How about a raffle, suggested Sarah. Perfect, replied Penny. Jump in. We've got work to do. At the fire station, auxiliary firefighter Trevor Evans was in the office with station officer Steele. Well, with these strong winds, I expect we'll have a few call-outs today, said station officer Steele. At that moment, Sam walked in. That's not all of our problems, said Fireman Sam. I've lost the money that we raised for the children's hospital. Once again, Sam told how the wind had blown the money away. We can't let the children down, said Station Officer Steele. Just then, a message came over the telex. Jump to it, crew, ordered Station Officer Steele. The wind has blown down the weather vane at Pontypande Church. It could be dangerous. The firefighters dashed out of the station and onto the forecourt, where Jupiter was waiting. They climbed aboard the fire engine and raced towards Pontypandy Town Centre, with the lights flashing and sirens blaring. When they arrived at the church, the firefighters quickly got to work. The weather vane is hanging from the spire, Station Officer Steele observed. We'll need the cutting equipment. Trevor positioned the extension ladder against the outside of the church. Oh dear, the ladder isn't long enough to reach the spire, he said. What are we going to do now? You'll have to go in through the church window and make your way up the tower from inside, Station Officer Steele told Sam and Trevor. There's a trap door at the top of the tower which leads to the roof. Sam went to get the metal cutters from Jupiter's locker while Trevor positioned the ladder beneath the church window. That's lucky, said Trevor. The ladder just reaches the window. Fireman Sam carried the equipment up the ladder, closely following behind Trevor. Station Officer Steele held the ladder steady. Easy, does it? said Station Officer Steele. Inside the tower, Fireman Sam found a ladder leading to a trapdoor. That door must lead to the roof, said Sam. I know you don't like heights, Trevor, so I'll go up first. Nonsense, Trevor protested bravely. Heights don't bother me. Trevor stepped towards the ladder, accidentally tripping over the cutters and into the belfry. Quickly, he reached out for the bell rope to stop his fall. The bell bonged loudly. Help! Trevor cried. I can't stand heights! Steady! called Fireman Sam as he grabbed Trevor and pulled him to safety. Oh, th thanks, Sam! <laughs> gulped Trevor. Are you all right? asked Sam. Except for my eardrums, he groaned. Fireman Sam climbed the ladder and opened the trapdoor to the roof. Trevor reluctantly followed. It looks as if nobody's been up here for years, he said. Dead leaves had piled up on the roof and were now blowing about in the gale. We must have been blown up here by the gale, replied Sam. Can we go back down now? called Trevor nervously. We haven't got what we came for, said Sam. One of us will have to climb the spire to get the weather vane. Trevor peered over the roof. It was a long way down. Don't worry, said Sam. I'll climb up the spire. You just hold the extra ladder steady. Carefully, Sam climbed to the top of the spire. The wind howled around his ears. It's a bit blowy up here, he said but his words got lost in the wind. Hurry up, Sam, called Trevor, clinging onto the ladder below. Fireman Sam quickly cut the weather vane away from the spire and climbed down the ladder. It's not a danger anymore, he said as he examined the broken vane, but I think it's hurry today. Can we go back inside the church tower now? asked Trevor. Fireman Sam grinned. Down you go, Trev. I'll be right behind you. As Sam watched Trevor descend the ladder into the tower, he noticed a familiar brown envelope amongst the piles of leaves on the roof. Great fires of London! he exclaimed, picking it up. This is the money I lost this morning. The wind must have blown it all the way up here. Station Officer Steele was waiting for Sam and Trevor when they reached the ground. Well done, he said. 
You've retrieved the weather vane, and you've found the fun run money. I say, well done. The firefighters at the fire station were celebrating with a cup of tea when Penny and the twins arrived. Look, Uncle Sam, said James excitedly. We organised a raffle and raised the hundred pounds you lost, added Sarah. You have, said Fireman Sam. He began to laugh. <laughs> oh, well done, you two. But I've already found the money from the fun run. It had blown onto the church tower. What shall we do with all the money we raised? asked Penny. I know, said Sam. If all the ticket holders agree, we can buy a new weather vane with the proceeds of the raffle. Superb idea, said Station Officer Steele. The next day, everyone gathered at Pandy Park for the raffle. What's the prize? asked Trevor. Shh, Trevor, said Fireman Sam. The twins are about to pick the winning ticket. On the bandstand, Sarah scrambled up the tickets and handed one to James. The winner is, called James, Auxiliary Firefighter Trevor Evans. I've won! I've won! shouted Trevor. Congratulations, said Sarah. You've won a trip in a hot air balloon. Oh, no, groaned Trevor. A hot air balloon. But I hate heights. Sam smells a rat. It was the start of another day in Pontypandy. The sun was shining, the sky was clear and bright, and all the birds were singing. Fireman Sam got up and threw open the windows. Ah, he said, taking a deep breath. There's nothing like the smell of fresh air to wake you up in the morning. Sam got ready for work, checked that all his buttons were shiny, and that his hat was at a jaunty angle, and set off for the fire station. As it was such a nice morning, he decided to set off earlier than usual and take a short stroll through the park. Being early, it was nice and peaceful in the park, and Sam quite enjoyed his stroll. He stopped by the flower beds for a moment to smell the flowers. He liked the flowers and wished he could stay longer, but he had to get to the fire station. On his way down the street, he passed Bella's Cafe. Even though it wasn't open yet, he could smell the aroma of freshly baked cakes. His mouth watered just thinking about them, and he was sorry to leave the smell behind as he walked on. Station Officer Steele was also on his way to the fire station, but he didn't feel as happy as Sam. You see, he had a cold, and it made him feel miserable. His nose was all blocked up, and he had to keep stopping to blow it. I can't smell anything, he moaned. I can't even smell my prize roses. This made him feel more miserable than ever, because he liked to smell them every day. Mind you, it also meant that he couldn't smell the pile of manure nearby that he was going to spread on the roses to help them grow. When Station Officer Steele and Sam arrived at the fire station, they met Elvis Cridlington, who was carrying a book. What do you read in? asked Sam. It's a, it's a cookbook, said Elvis proudly, full of exotic and foreign recipes. I thought I might try you on today. It'll make a change. Anything will make a change if it's edible, grumbled Steele. So, Elvis went into the kitchen with his cookbook, Steele went into his office with his cold, and Sam, well, Sam was thinking. The more he thought about Elvis and his exotic recipes, the more he thought about going to Bella's cafe for lunch and about the mouth-watering smell that had wafted from her kitchen. 
Meanwhile, at Mrs. Price's store, a package had arrived for her son, Norman. At last, he said mysteriously. Making sure he was alone, he tore off the brown wrapping paper to reveal a small cardboard box. He opened it. It's my stink bombs, he exclaimed gleefully and smiled a mischievous smile. Norman wondered what to do with them. Well, he knew what to do with them. It was just a case of where. A moment later, Norman chuckled to himself. I know just the place, he said, scampering up the street towards the fire station. At the fire station, it had been a fairly quiet morning. Sam was snoozing, Steele was sneezing, and Elvis was doing his best with the exotic cooking. Naughty Norman crept into the station, and when he saw that there was nobody about, he let off one of his stink bombs by Jupiter's front tire. Norman ran off to watch from a safe distance. The stench from the stink bomb spread through the fire station floating silently upstairs to where Sam was dreaming about Bella's cooking. Sam sniffed and awoke with a start. His nose wrinkled up. Oh, what's that awful smell? Elvis, have you burnt the lunch again? He called. No, I haven't, said Elvis indignantly. There's nothing wrong with... Oh, what's that smell? They called station officer Steele, but he was next to useless. He couldn't smell a thing because of his cold. I think it's coming from downstairs, said Sam. He slid down the pool. Sure enough, the smell was stronger. Sam threw open the big fire station doors and opened all the windows. The awful smell soon began to disappear. Ah, that's better, sighed Sam. Nice, fresh air. It was then that he spotted the remains of the stink bomb. Hmm, he said thoughtfully. Norman crept away, sniggering. Norman crept around town all morning, letting off stink bombs and annoying people. Later, he boarded Trevor Evans' bus. Sarah and James, Fireman Sam's niece and nephew, were also aboard. Norman sat at the back of the bus, seeming very innocent. He waited until nobody was looking, then he let off a stink bomb. Oh, what's that smell? He said, pretending he didn't know what it was. Oh, it's awful, squealed Sarah. They went up to the front of the bus to get away from the smell, but it followed them. Goodness, cried Trevor when he smelt it. What's that? Trevor ushered the children out of the door, opened all the windows, and got off the bus. They all had to sit by the side of the road and wait for the smell to disappear before they could get back on the bus and continue their journey. Norman was trying very hard not to laugh. When most of the smell had gone, everybody climbed back on board, taking care to leave the windows open. The bus came round by the park, and naughty Norman got off and scurried away. Sarah and James thanked Trevor for the ride and went over to Bella's cafe. The smell still lingered in the bus, so Trevor called into Mrs. Price's store for something to disguise it. He picked up a can of air freshener. You know, it's a funny thing, said Mrs. Price. I've been doing a roaring trade in air fresheners today. Suddenly, everybody wants air fresheners. Can you imagine? Trevor said he could. Meanwhile, Sarah and James were in Bella's cafe. They took a long time to choose what they wanted from the menu, while Bella waited patiently. Well, what do you have? She asked finally. We have two ice cream sodas and... Two cream cakes, please, said James. 
While Sarah and James sat down at one of the tables, Bella pottered around in the kitchen. It was there that she smelt a funny smell. She switched the cooker off and looked in the oven. These are certainly not of my cakes, she said. But she couldn't think what else it could be. And the smell was getting stronger. Bella went back into the cafe. Sarah, James, she said. There's a funny smell in my kitchen. Will you go and fetch your Uncle Sam for me? Maybe he will know what it is. Sarah and James could see that she looked worried. So they hurried off at once. Sarah and James ran up the road to the fire station. Uncle Sam, they cried. You must come quickly. Bella says you can smell something funny in a kitchen. Aha, said Sam, thinking back to the stink bomb he found. So the stink bomb phantom is at it again, is he? Fireman Sam pressed the alarm button. The bells rang, and Elvis and Station Officer Steele came sliding down the pool. They were in such a hurry that Elvis almost forgot he was still wearing his kitchen apron. Come on, said Sam. Bella's got a smelly problem down at the cafe. They all climbed into the fire engine, and with the bells ringing, they raced through the streets to Bella's cafe. When they got there, Bella was standing outside on the pavement, still looking worried. What's the matter, Bella? asked Sam. It's uh, the smell. It's getting so bad, she replied. Sam poked his head round the cafe door gingerly and took a gentle sniff. His nose twitched as he tried to identify the smell. He soon realized that it wasn't a stink bomb. It was something else. He went back and had a quiet word with Station Officer Steele. Everybody back now, said Steele, importantly, making sure they stayed away from the cafe. We've got a gas leak. Sam had opened one of Jupiter's lockers and was putting on a fireman's gas mask. God, a mia, exclaimed Bella when she saw him. Don't worry, Bella, said Steele. Sam will sort it out. Sam entered the cafe in his gas mask, carrying a bag of special tools. He walked behind the counter and into the kitchen beyond. He looked around, trying to find out where the leak was coming from. He heard a hissing sound coming from near the cooker. Sam knelt down by the cooker, and sure enough, he found the gas leak. The gas pipe that was connected to the cooker had a faulty valve. He put his special tool back down and rummaged around in it. Who will have this fixed? He said through his gas mask. Sam pulled tools out of his bag. He twiddled and he tightened. He banged and he clanged. He twisted and he turned. And soon he was satisfied. There, it's fixed. It's as good as you know. It won't leak gas again. And he packed his tools away and went to tell Bella the good news. Meanwhile, around the corner at the general store, Mrs. Price watched the fire engine outside Bella's. Goodness, whatever's going on? She asked herself. There were people standing round on the pavement and she couldn't see much from her shop door. So she wandered over to see what all the fuss was about. Oh dear! What's happening, Bella? Asked Mrs. Price when she crossed the road. They tell me I have a gas leak, sniffed Bella. Fireman Sam has gone in to fix it. He should be out any minute. Mrs. Price craned her neck to see. Was that Sam coming out of the door now? Sam? in his gas mask, almost bumped into Mrs. Price when he came out. The sudden, unexpected sight of Sam in his mask frightened her. Ah! She screamed. It was difficult to tell who was the most startled. 
but it must have been Mrs. Price, because she fainted. Luckily, Sam caught her. Steele grabbed the first aid box from the fire engine. These smelling salts will bring her round, he said, waving a small bottle under her nose. Sam took his gas mask off, so as not to give her another fright. It's her own fault, laughed Steele. She shouldn't be so nosy. Oh, what happened? asked Mrs. Price weakly when she opened her eyes. You fainted, said Steele. I remember, he said. Something black and horrible. That was my gas mask, laughed Sam, holding it up for her to see. Mrs. Price did feel silly, and she went bright red with embarrassment. While all this had been going on, Naughty Norman had been watching from his hiding place in the park. All those people, he chortled. That's just the place to let off my last stink bomb. He wandered over as innocently as he could and took out his little cardboard box. Hello? What's going on here? Boomed station officer Steele, walking up behind Norman and making him jump. So you're the culprit behind the foul smell in the fire station, are you? Just be thankful I couldn't smell it with my cold. And with that, he marched Norman off to his mother. Steele told Mrs. Price all about her son's antics and showed her the remaining stink bomb. Norman stood there, looking very guilty, while his mother scolded him. Whatever will I do with you, Norman Price? She said. If you'll pardon me, said Steele, I can think of just the thing. They went round to Steele's house. There, he said, pointing to the pile of manure. I want that lot spreading on my roses. But it smells awful, squealed Norman. Then wear a peg on your nose, said Steele. So Norman did. And funnily enough, he never used stink bombs again. When he hears the fire bell chime, Fireman Sam is there on time. Putting on his coat and hat in less than seven seconds flat. He's always on the scene. Fireman Sam and his engine's bright and clean. Fireman Sam, you cannot ignore. Sam is the hero next door.